Earlier this month, the National Marine Fisheries Service decided to list Snake River sockeye salmon as an endangered species. This preliminary decision does not become final for a year, but it had been awaited with interest because it's the first concerning Columbia and Snake River stocks and because subtle biological distinctions were involved in the decision. Science reporter Joe Cohn from Oregon State University prepared this story. The tricky issue that the agency has had to deal with is this. Do individual populations of salmon, salmon stocks, qualify as species under the law? No one is arguing that all sockeye, chinook, and coho salmon are currently near extinction in the Columbia and Snake Rivers. Rather, certain local runs appear to be clearly in jeopardy. The question is, do they qualify for protection under the law? The answer hinges on how species is defined. Webster's definition offers a starting point populations of organisms capable of interbreeding. But the Endangered Species Act goes farther to grant protection not only to the whole unit, all Chinook salmon, for example, but also to what the law calls distinct population segments. This is where the difficulties begin, because distinct population segments was coined as a legal term, not a biological one. For the Columbia and Snake decisions, the National Marine Fisheries Service tried to develop a clear biological definition in a couple of recent technical reports. These reports laid out two criteria that qualify a population as a distinct population segment. It must be isolated from other populations in terms of its reproduction, and it must represent an important component in the evolutionary legacy of the species as a whole. Merritt Tuttle is the Endangered Species Coordinator with the Fishery Service in Portland. The service tested the Snake River sockeye, which come from Redfish Lake, against these two criteria. These fish are uh, around um, 700 miles from the nearest sockeye population. So um, uh, they are a geographically isolated uh, reproductive unit. The second criterion seems more subjective. How do you decide if a population is important to the evolutionary legacy of a species? Merritt Tuttle. And what we're talking about there is, has it been isolated for so long that it's evolved and has different characteristics than the rest of the species out there as a whole? Um, in the case of um, the redfish lake sockeye, uh, they were um, the longest running fish, the longest migrating fish uh, in fresh water of any of the sockeye we know of, know of. In addition, they spawned at the highest elevation of any fish, uh, any of the sockeye that we knew, knew of, and they were th the most southerly population uh, in the sockeye range. So there were some unique characteristics there. That, uh, that led us to believe that uh, they represented an important part of the evolutionary legacy of the species. So both of the major characteristics were met in the case of the sockeye. Tuttle says that the fishery service didn't make its decision based solely on its own information, however, but drew upon the expertise of 34 members of a technical committee composed of scientists representing essentially all of the parties interested in the Columbia River. While the fisheries service has gone to a good deal of trouble to develop a technically detailed definition of species, some observers criticize the agency for narrowing its attention too much in this process. Dan Rolfe is a lawyer for some of the conservation groups petitioning the agency. He is also an adjunct law professor at Lewis and Clark and has written a book on the Endangered Species Act. Rolfe argues that in writing the law, Congress intended for species to be protected to preserve broader interests than just the preservation of distinct populations. Many species play important ecological roles. So, for example, sea otters play a very important role in structuring uh, the entire nearshore community by feeding on invertebrates, which in turn feed on kelp. And if sea otters are gone, that the population of invertebrates goes up. They decimate the kelp beds, which in turn support a great number of other life forms, and thus when you uh, cause extinction of sea otters, you greatly uh, impoverish the entire ecosystem. Um, under the nymph definition of a species, um, it does not take such ecological contributions of the species into account. 
So, in other words, it only looks at the species in and of itself. It does not consider that a particular species may play a key role in its ecosystem. Disputes about the interpretation of the law and of the biology of individual populations are likely only to intensify in coming months as the other Columbia petitions come to decision. For Oregon Sea Grant, KLCC and KLCO, I'm Joe Cohn. Earlier this month, a federal wildlife agency indicated its intent to protect a northwest salmon population from extinction. This action of the National Marine Fisheries Service on behalf of the Snake River sockeye salmon elevated the whole endangered fish problem in public awareness. To discuss the risks facing fish populations and the use of the Endangered Species Act to address those risks, fish advocate Bill Bakke visited Oregon State University last week. Science reporter Joe Cohn was there and filed this report. Bakke, the executive director of the conservation group Oregon Trout, is one of the leaders of efforts to protect wild fish in the state and region. He has been the spokesman for the groups that petitioned to have four Columbia salmon populations protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. At OSU, Bakke began by describing the threatened status of wild populations in the state and the region. Bakke said the reports from government and non-government sources indicate that 177 fish populations are in danger of extinction in Oregon. Every watershed in the state has a, has a fish population that is in trouble, but we really aren't addressing the problem, is the point. Turning to the Northwest region as a whole, Bakke referred to a study just published by the Endangered Species Committee of the American Fisheries Society. The committee identified 214 local populations of salmon and trout in Oregon, Washington, California, and Idaho that are at risk. Bakke pointed out that not only the Columbia Basin, but coastal populations are involved. Of the 214, 101 are located on the coast. Coastwide, the salmon ecosystem, I think, is in terrible shape, and we're facing, I think, the eventual extinction of that ecosystem unless we can change the way the culture uh, lives within those watersheds. Bakke was questioned whether conservation interests felt that it was necessary to petition the federal government to protect salmon runs under the Endangered Species Act, which is expected to cause some economic hardship. Bakke says that from their experience, conservationists felt that they couldn't get management agencies to be responsive in any other way. I tried for, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years to administratively change uh, the state and federal agencies to protect salmon, wild salmon. You couldn't do it. You couldn't get them to do it. Protection requirements under the Endangered Species Act have the power to change the way the Columbia River is managed, and fish may be expected to benefit. But Bakke says conservation groups are not intending now to issue any sizable number of petitions for other at-risk fish populations. Instead, he hopes that dire predictions will motivate some constructive behavior. The Endangered Species Act will scare people enough to cause management to change of the habitats and of the species themselves to restore them without invoking the Endangered Species Act. If we can't do that, then uh, we'll, we lose the game because the Endangered Species Act won't, won't recover them either. Bakke told his OSU audience that he sees the Endangered Species Law as primarily a tool for calling attention to a problem and getting solutions underway. He noted that protection under the law has been no guarantee in practice that an animal population would be restored to its previous abundance. Ultimately, of course, the endangered salmon issue is not just about fish any more than the spotted owl issue was about birds. Both are about whole ecosystems and about what sort of environment people want to have. It's not a matter of uh, protecting individual animals or species, but the ecosystem within which they live and depend upon. And you have to do something for the animals too, but you also got to protect the environment that sustains them. And if you do anything less than that, we can't hope to maintain them. They're going to go extinct. For Oregon Sea Grant and OPB Radio, I'm Joe Cohn. At Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River, fish researchers have been addressing one of the most critical issues facing Columbia Basin salmon. If salmon runs are going to be increased, a high survival rate for juvenile fish moving downriver is important, but high survival has been hard to obtain. Science reporter Joe Cohn from Oregon State University went to Bonneville recently to see the problem firsthand. Here is his report.
Walking through the concrete and steel guts of the giant second powerhouse at Bonneville Dam gives a vivid impression of what small fish are up against at a dam. Studies have shown that, in general, about 15% of the juveniles die in passing through turbines at each of the Columbia River dams. For the populations that have to pass through several dams, the cumulative loss can be very serious. Although many juveniles will go over spillways or through turbines, biologists prefer them to be shunted away from the turbines through powerhouse bypass systems. Oregon State University fish biologist Alec Mall leads me through the powerhouse to see part of this system. It's pretty noisy down here and they say not to go down without when this bypass was installed in 1981, it was considered state-of-the-art. Huge moving screens block fish from getting to the turbines and carry them to an outflow pipe that leads to the other side of the powerhouse and outside, Alec Mall. All along here, there are outlets the fish can dump into this right into this uh, sluiceway from each of the various turbine intakes. And once they get into this sluiceway, they would go, might coming on down this way and drop into that pipe that we saw, basically a vertical pipe straight down. There's been a problem with this bypass system, however. Studies by the National Marine Fisheries Service have shown that small fish that go through the system don't survive much better than fish that go through the turbines. Out on the tail race, where the water emerges from the powerhouse, the researchers are conducting an experiment to figure out why. Earl Dolly is the project leader with the fisheries service. Physical injury isn't, isn't the problem, so we're thinking that maybe the decreased survival is associated with predation on fish after they've gone through the bypass system and are passing down through the river. Biologists believe that squawfish are the bad guys in this story. These predators devour millions of young salmon, and the small salmon that go through the bypass, where water rips along at 25 feet per second, are quite possibly physically stressed by the experience. Earl Dolly. In uh, some situations, if the fish is highly stressed, they aren't as capable of avoiding predators as those fish that aren't stressed. So that's one of our serious concerns about the bypass system. So Alec Mall has been brought in to measure the stress levels in juveniles that go through the bypass system versus those that don't. To obtain some fish for the experiment, the researchers are out on the tail race with a large net. The net has been put around the opening of the pipe from the bypass system, and once the fish are in the net, about a half dozen men begin hauling the net onto a small barge. get easier, more time to do it. <laughs> I think it's harder. One of the men scoops out about 30 of the silvery fish and hands this small net to Alec Mall, who quickly anesthetizes them so that the stress level he will measure relates to their experience only up to that point. He takes them inside the cabin of the boat, where he and an assistant have a makeshift lab set up on top of a barrel. The fish are sorted into groups that went through the bypass and those that didn't. The researchers take blood plasma samples from the six inch long fish, drawing the samples up into a pipette and then blowing it out into tiny specimen containers. Maul explains that he'll be looking for the presence of a particular substance in the samples. When you have a chance back in the lab, we'll assay for cortisol, which is a hormone that uh, increases when uh, humans or fish or, or most vertebrates are, uh, are stressed. If he finds higher levels of the hormone in the juveniles that went through the bypass than in those that did not, this may indicate the source of the survival problem. Ultimately, changes will be made to the bypass system at Bonneville based on the findings of this study. Back outside the cabin, Maul reflects on the overall difficulty of trying to perpetuate these animals by making adjustments to our industrial technology. Now that's really the problem, I think, is that, that the fish evolved in a different system than what we have today, and so it, it kind of, if they survive long enough, maybe they'll evolve to, to deal with the, the dams. But, uh, you know, that really is the question that's, that's coming to bear right now, is will they survive that long? For Oregon Sea Grant, KLCC and KLCO, I'm Joe Cohn.
Since the Northwest salmon crisis emerged as an issue a year ago, much of the attention has been on the business and government interests that will have to adjust to new salmon protection regimes. Often overlooked in discussions are the interests and perspectives of Indian people who are closely affected by the salmon crisis. Science reporter Joe Cohn of Oregon State University sought out one of the Indian leaders to learn his views, and he prepared this report. Ted Strong is the executive director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, which represents the fish interests of the Yakima, Nez Perce, Umatilla, and Warm Springs tribes. He gave a talk and answered some questions not long ago at Oregon State University. Strong is a Yakima, raised in a traditional way, and when he speaks, he connects the fishing interests of the tribes to their broader cultural identity. For Columbia Indians, and for many others of the Northwest, salmon are central to their way of life, which before the coming of white settlers was marked by natural abundance. One hundred years ago, the mid-Columbia tribes harvested about five million salmon per year. For Indians, the times have changed dramatically. Ted Strong. This year, the Indian people will be allowed to catch 30,000 fall Chinook. And that represents uh, one half of one percent of the abundance that we enjoyed back prior to the building of these dams. And the question has been asked, well, what are Indians giving up? We've given up 99.5% of what we enjoyed. We have one half of 1% of that left. Not only have the populations of salmon declined, but the Indian population has declined as well, in parallel, says Strong. From a population of 60,000 a hundred years ago, the mid-Columbia tribes declined to about 10,000 in 1920, he says. The Indians believe restoration of the salmon runs is vital to the continued survival of their culture. But Indians are wary of hatchery-raised fish. They preferred wild ones. They're, they're born and they, they hatch in the little eggs, and what they do is they, they eat the decomposed body of their, their parents. The parents literally give their lives for the young. Indian people see that as this unbroken chain of life, and that there was a promise <laughs> made by the Creator to have that perpetual life cycle. When, when we first saw hatchery fish, they, they were fed something, whatever it is, cereal or whatever it is. And uh, it, the elderly people couldn't see how those young would ever inherit all of the, the strength and the spirituality that came from that life-giving of their, their parents. Nonetheless, the mid-Columbia tribes are now interested in developing a different type of hatchery, which is supposed to supplement wild fish rather than replace them. Today, the uh, four tribes who represent uh, the, the parenthood of the Fish Commission have a, a supplementation program, and that is purely supplementation, in that it provides um, a supplement to the wild stocks by reintroducing uh, the appropriate genetic stocks in areas that presently are barren of any salmon. Others may criticize Indians for their fishery development plans or expect them to make new restrictions on their harvests. Strong points out that the tribes have been forced to depend on hatcheries owned by others, and now the tribal commercial fishery has been greatly restricted. The Indians, he suggests, may be excused if they take a skeptical view of new compromises which entail new expectations placed on them. Indian people, by their nature, are very generous people. We generously shared the abundance of natural wealth that the Creator put here when the non-Indians came to live among us. When the first uh, non-Indians arrived, all that the non-Indian had to offer to the Indian was a handshake. His hand was empty. The Indian was the, the holder of everything that was uh, natural and abundant. And that abundance has been devastated, not by the Indian.
For Oregon Sea Grant, KLCC and KLCO, I'm Joe Cohn.